Hello friends, I hope you are all having a great time this week. Today I have come up with an interesting critical care topic for which I was invited uh, to moderate a session in workshop for sepsis in Bengaluru that was the GICS 2022. The sepsis induced cardiomyopathy was first described by Parker et al. in 1984 as a reversible syndrome of non ischemic cardiac dysfunction with systolic and or diastolic LV dysfunction and sometimes in 50% of cases RV dysfunction is also there. The reported prevalence of SICM varies widely from 10% to 70% in patients with sepsis. Overall it is acute onset but reversible cardiomyopathy which typically uh, resolves within 7 to 10 days. How does it occur? Well, we are still trying to figure out its exact mechanism of development. So in cytokine theory, there is production of cytokines like IL-1, beta and TNF alpha, which are inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines can directly inhibit the myocardial contractility. Then there is another theory which is called sympathetic overactivity theory, which suggests that sympathetic overactivity in sepsis can lead to myocardial depression because of tachycardia. So tachycardia shortens the diastole time and hence reduces the LV filling. Now there is another theory that looks more exact and can explain the development of SICM and which is the nitric oxide theory in which they say that bacterial endotoxin can lead to overproduction of nitric oxide by inducible and endothelial nitric oxide okay and that can cause uh, vasodilation and uh, decrease in the preload and also can reduce the uh, sensitivity of myofilaments to the calcium so it reduces the calcium sensitivity then another uh, important fact which came out of nitric oxide impact on the myocardial uh, function is they it, it can down regulate the beta receptors okay and, and also it increases the myocardial permeability in the heart so there are certain signs which can probably help you to detect the SICM or to suspect the SICM like cool peripheries, reduced SCVO2 that is central venous oxygen level and also failure to respond to uh, fluid challenge or vasopressor therapy. So in those cases you should suspect myocardial depression and uh, there is sometimes extreme tachycardia on uh, ECG and sometimes there is atrial fibrillation which also uh, should raise the suspicion of SICM. Sometimes there is elevated cardiac markers of ischemia along with mild ECG changes which compel the critical care specialist to consider or at least doubt underlying coronary ischemia which may be possible also and you can expect that both SICM and coronary ischemia can occur simultaneously. And you may not be wrong if you put your patient on anti ischemic agents. Certainly, it is unclear whether troponin level or peak troponin you know, level correlates with the SICM diagnosis. Additionally, there may be multiple factors that can dilute a diagnostic uh, utility of troponin. For example, a patient with traumatic uh, injury or patients with acute kidney injury. So, in such cases, uh, troponin may be falsely high. Sepsis induced cardiomyopathy is associated with BNP rise, although not independently, whereas left ventricular filling pressures do not correlate with the BNP level. The severity of critical illness uh, rather than sepsis induced cardiomyopathy was probably the main determinant of uh, BNP rise in critical patients with sepsis. For this reason, BNP should not be you know, used as a predictive marker of SICM. Bedside transthoracic echocardiography this is the gold standard for the diagnosis of SICM. Every hemodynamically unstable patient should undergo uh, bedside transthoracic echocardiography. It is very important. LV ejection fraction, which we usually, uh, you know, which is very fancy uh, echocardiographic parameter, is not sensitive indicator of intrinsic myocardial contractility, but it reflects the interaction between the LV. Uh, myocardial contractility and LV afterload and in sepsis uh, initial stages when you have not started the vasopressor therapy due to extreme vasodilated state 
and reduced after load, LV ejection fraction might appear to be normal. That is actually pseudo normalization. But in reality, there would be a depression in the cardiac contractility. So we should uh, look for diastolic dysfunction. That is more important, which is easily detected on tissue doctor imaging. Uh, if you are an expert, obviously, and everything you can learn on echocardiography. If your senior is around, there will be a lower E prime and high E by E prime, which has been shown to be more prognostic uh, uh, than LVF alone uh, for SICM patients. This chamber is also affected in about 50% of cases with sepsis and septic shock and there are, there are various uh, factors that contribute to the pathogenesis of RV dysfunction in sepsis like hypoxemia, hypercapnia, invasive mechanical ventilation uh, using high P in case of uh, ARDS. So the right ventricle dysfunction is defined according to ASC criteria. So that is number one is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion that is TAPC. So if TAPC is less than 16 millimeter, the excursion is not very good. That also suggests uh, RV dysfunction. The second criteria is the tricuspid systolic lateral annular velocity that is TDI STR wave if it is less than 15 centimeter per second and the third criteria RV fractional area change RV FAC if it is less than 35 percent. Now there is a new echocardiographic technique uh, called spectral tracking which gives you the marker called global longitudinal strain GLS okay so that you must remember this denotes the change in the length during systole compared to that in diastole it is a better surrogate measure of lv contractility compared to lv ejection fraction the first important differential diagnosis is the uh, acute dilated cardiomyopathy which may occur in viral cases virus uh, cardiomyopathy Tachycardia for a prolonged period can also result in diastolic and systolic ventricular dysfunction even in absence of other cardiac diseases. So that is known as tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Similarly, high catecholamine level can also induce cardiomyopathy which I have explained in the pathophysiology of SICM, the sympathetic overactivity. We have acute coronary syndrome which may closely mimic the SICM and can lead to ischemic cardiomyopathy which is often a close differential diagnosis of SICM. Takot Subo cardiomyopathy is a temporary heart condition uh, that develops in response to an intense emotional or physical experience okay, or uh, stress which is known as stress cardiomyopathy or sometimes called as broken heart syndrome. On echocardiography you will find apical ballooning, so ballooning resembling the octopus trap configuration the apex and the lateral ventricle segment are hypokinetic while the base is hyperkinetic so carbon dioxide gaps which uh, which are very important to be used as a surrogate for the adequacy of cardiac output and as a marker of tissue perfusion and therefore a potential target for resuscitation similarly lactate clearance which may be used but higher mortality has been observed in adromeda shock study especially in patients who had normal capillary refill time. So capillary refill time, uh, which is now again in the fashion, it, has, it may be measured by applying firm pressure uh, to the uh, distal flanks for 10 seconds. And if it is less than 2 or 3 seconds, it's normal. Should we target depressed contractility? So because this is the main problem in the sepsis induced cardiomyopathy, so that's, that should be your therapeutic target. No, it should not be. Because as the prognostic value of septic LV dysfunction is unclear, treatment of this dysfunction or this contractility is debated. People tend to start dopamine in the hope to increase the inotropy. Dopamine may not be very useful in improving the perfusion parameters. A randomized control study by Hernandez et al. reported no improvement of microcirculatory perfusion parameters despite significant increase in the heart rate and cardiac index and LV ejection fraction in patients with septic shock receiving dobutamine. So that's a problem. Okay, so dobutamine uh, should not be used uh, in hope to improve the contractility and, and reverse the sepsis induced cardiomyopathy. 
Moreover, there is a lack of quality evidence that dobutamine improves the survival. Rather, we have a strong evidence that dobutamine may adversely affect the outcome in patients with sepsis. So that's important uh, fact we should remember. The only advantage uh, with levosimendian is that it does not cause tachycardia and it is a calcium sensitizer because calcium sensitization reduced in SICM. So that is the main pathophysiology and probably uh, this uh, levosimendian hits there. So rate control using various agents is something that relaxes the heart and hence worth trying option to improve the IV performance. We have two rate controllers, remember that. Beta blocker traditionally all everybody know and also we have ibuprofen. Beta blocker are not great agents to be used in SICM. Moreover, systolic dysfunction is a contraindication for the use of beta blockers in such patients. So beta blockers uh, may cause severe hypertension and hemodynamic instability in such patients. Be better not to be used. Ibuprofen is, is an attractive rate control agent because it provides heart rate lowering effect without negative inotropy, without de depressing the contractility. So ibuprofen reduces the heart rate by prolonging the diastole while the negative inotropic action of beta blocker prolongs post systole and diastole. Okay. So this is important difference between beta blocker and ibuprofen. As we have shown that nitric oxide is a big culprit and there is a role of methylene blue. The studies have shown a significant improvement in blood pressure and decreased requirement of suppressors. But still there is no hard, uh, no firm evidence to use. And it is not without risk because it can contribute to serotonin syndrome, pulmonary vasoconstriction and impaired mesenteric blood flow. So that's important. As we know, the positive fluid balance is a poor prognostic factor. Okay, the, that is a very important point. So you should avoid the positive fluid balance. And it is more dramatic in patients with septic cardiomyopathy. Any extra ounce of fluid may be detrimental. Okay, it can cause rapid mortality because of abnormal frank sterling relationships uh, in the myofibrils of myocardium. So it is necessary to be judicious with the fluid management of the initial resuscitation phase by using dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness such as uh, PPV, SEV, PLR testing or uh, tire volume challenge test etc. So many, so many fluid responsive testings are available. I think uh, we should use, we should be more pro with uh, using such dynamic parameters of fluid responsiveness. Now, to sum up, I can say that SICM is common in septic shock uh, in about 50% of it can occur. It should be suspected early in patients with septic shock who are not responding or who are worsening as vasoactive doses are increasing. In such patients, definitely we should consider SICM. Timely access to Echocardiography or point of care ultrasound is paramount to detect the patient with the SICM, especially the RV dysfunction and LV diastolic dysfunction. And remember, D dimer and TROP T may be positive in a stress cardiomyopathy and should never be used as the reliable prognostic markers of SICM. I urge and request all postgraduate super specialty trainees in critical care medicine to conduct more research on this important topic which is needed today to help us to treat our patients in a better way. So that's all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Kindly like this video, subscribe this video and share with all your colleagues so that the good information reach to all. Bye bye. Take care.